Hello, good morning, my dear students. Today we are going to continue about talking about excretion in humans. Last time we talked about excretion in humans through the skin and we talked about the structure of the skin and the sweating. Today we are going to discuss the second organ and the most important organ in the excretory system of the humans, which is the kidneys or in general, the urinary system. So kidneys, uh, all vertebrates have two kidneys. They differ from one species to another according to the development of this species. Lower vertebrates or amphibians, such as amphibians, have long uh, kidneys. They are thin, they are less developed, and they extend along the sides of the vertebral column. On the other hand, higher vertebrates like mammals and, for example, like humans, they have more compact, more firm kidneys. They are smaller in size compared, of course, to the size of the, uh, of the animal. And they lie beneath the peritoneum. What is the peritoneum? The peritoneum is a very thin membrane that encloses our viscera, our internal organs. So our stomach, our uh, small intestine, our kidney, our sorry liver, they are all enclosed by the peritoneum. So the kidneys are not inside the peritoneum, they are behind the peritoneum. So let's compare between the, the kidneys or the urinary system in the lower vertebrates compared to the higher vertebrates. Both have kidneys and each kidney is connected to a thin tube called ureter and these ureters deliver or collect and transfer the urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder and in higher vertebrates the urine is expelled outside the body from the urinary bladder through a small thin tube also called ureter so let's discuss in detail the urinary system in humans. As we said, it consists of two kidneys, right kidney and the left kidney, two ureters, right and left also, urinary bladder and a urethra. So how about the kidneys? Where they are located? They are located at the upper part of the abdominal cavity and they are present behind the peritoneum. We have one kidney at each side of our vertebral colon and the size, as we said, it is more compact than the lower vertebrates. Of course, it is not smaller in size, it is more compact. It is smaller compared to the overall size of the animal. The length of the human kidney is uh, around 12 centimeters, the width is 7 and the thickness is 3 centimeters. How uh, is the kidney's shape? Description of the kidney. They are bean shaped. You know, a bean. This is like a bean shape. The outer side is convex and the inner side is concave. And the inner side, we call it the pelvis. What is the pelvis? It is the inner concave side of the kidney from which the renal artery enters and the renal artery is a branch from the aorta coming from the aorta and the renal vein exits and renal veins pours into exactly the inferior vena cava and also the ureter emerges this is all happens in the pelvis of the kidney. What is the structure of the kidney? If we cut a, a kidney longitudinally, we will have this shape. A longitudinal section, we will have a narrow outer region, this light pink color, uh, and this is called the cortex, and a broad inner uh, region, which is this part, darker uh, 
purple color or pink color we call it zamedalla if we take uh, one part like this um, triangle for example and we enlarge it we will see that inside the cortex and the medulla we will have what is called nephrons these very fine structures and they run through the, uh, throughout the cortex and the medulla and they reach the pelvis at the end so this is the cortex this is the medulla and this is the pelvis so what's a nephron this is uh, the structure of a nephron and it, we can see it is a little bit complicated here but we will try to uh, simplify it together uh, first we need to know that the nephron is the functional unit of the kidneys this is where the urine is formed and extracted and each kidney consists of more than one million nephrons so one human being have more than two million nephrons they are very thin or fine tubes we call them tubules and they are surrounded by blood capillaries everywhere so this is one nephron if we try to simplify the structure of a nephron to make it a little bit more clear it is differentiated into five parts so this is one nephron and we can see it consists of different shapes the first part is bowman's capsule what is bowman capsule this part let's see it up close this is the first part of the nephric tubule as we can see here this is the nephric tubule and this is the artery the renal artery uh, a branch from the renal artery entering the nephric tubule or the nephron and it enters through bowman's capsule so what's a bowman capsule it's the first part of the nephric tubule it is a swollen shaped structure and it is a cup shape it has the shape of a cup and it has very thin double wall and this is where the renal artery enters this is a branch from the renal artery coming from the aorta and they enter the uh, nephric tubule through bowman's uh, capsule forming what we call glomerulus so this very fine uh, uh, blood vessels inside the bowman's capsule we call them glomerulus second part is the proximal convoluted tubules this looks very complicated name but actually if you understand it we will know it's not that complicated the word the proximal means near so this is the first part near the glomerulus near the beginning of the nephron so we call it proximal and the word convoluted we heard it before many times convoluted means coiled and tubules we already know it's a thin or very fine tube so proximal convoluted tubules it's the first coiled part of the nephron uh, of the nephric tubule or tube they are present in the cortex we can see that these lines separate the cortex from the medulla so the proximal convoluted tubules always are present in the cortex and they are coiled tubules because they are called convoluted so they are coiled and they are also known as the first coiled tubules because they are the first part after the uh, bowman's capsule and the glomerulus so proximal or first coiled or convoluted tubules second part is loop of henley loop of henley enters into the medulla and it is a u-shaped structure third part fourth part sorry is the distal convoluted tubules so it is also a convoluted tubules but this is near the beginning of the nephric tube and this is far from the um, nephric uh, uh, the beginning of the nephric tubule so we call it distal distal as we can hear it similar to distant distant mean away 
okay so this is the four convoluted tubules or we can also call it second convoluted tubules and it is also present in the cortex last part is the collecting duct and the collecting duct is not for only one nephron collecting duct uh, combine different nephrons together different nephron distal convoluted tubules pour the urine into the collecting duct and the collecting duct transfer the um, urine to the pelvis and from the pelvis we know that the ureter emerges so it collects the urine from different nephrons not only one nephron and it transfer it to the ureter to the pelvis and from the pelvis to the ureter so let's see what is the ureter we have two ureters right and left and they are very thin tubules emerges from the kidneys pelvis they pass urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder drop by drop so kidneys don't store urine kidneys each drop of urine formed in the kidney is transferred directly at once through the ureter to the urinary bladder and they open at the back of the urinary bladder and they are inclined position inclined means a little bit skewed they are not straight line and as we can see here we cannot see the opening of the ureter because they are at the back of the urinary bladder third structure in our urinary system is the urinary bladder urinary bladder this is a section in the urinary bladder this is what it looks inside so it's a muscle like sac and it can stretch or extend when full of urine so it collapses when it's empty and it stretches when it is full and this stretch make us feel that the urine needs to pass out at the end of the urinary bladder we have a sphenector which is a voluntary muscle which controls the exit of the urine to the outside when the urine full uh, fills the urinary bladder the walls contracts and the sphenicer opens to push the urine out through the urethra so what's the urethra it's as we see a thin tube or duct connected to the base of the urinary bladder and it allows the body to expel urine to the outside of the body this is the complete structure of our urinary bladder so let's go back to nephrons and see how urines are extracted we have two kidneys and each kidney is connected to the aorta through two branches from uh, the kidney uh, uh, coming from the aorta sorry coming from the descending aorta and each one is called renal artery each renal artery enters each kidney and they branch into arterioles and this uh, large number of arterioles branches into a very heavy network of blood capillaries and each blood capillary enters Bowman's capsule forming glomerulus as we said before so this is a branch of the arterioles of the renal artery urine extracted in the nephrons through two steps the first step is what we call filtration through which all the plasma components all the blood components except blood cells and large parts of proteins are filtered into the glomerulus and they enter through Bowman's capsule to the nephron this filter blood includes water wastes glucose mineral salts and water soluble vitamins so all blood components except large molecules of proteins blood platelets rbcs and white bcs second uh, step in the urine extraction is the selective reabsorption if 
we get rid of all what is filtered, we will lose lots of water and lots of needed uh, minerals and vitamins. So what happens is that as this filtered uh, blood component or plasma components pass through the tubules, reabsorption of essential components occur. And if we remember these um, tubes, or this nephron was surrounded by blood from everywhere, so they are reabsorbed again into the blood. Mostly, water, glucose, minerals, and vitamins needed by the blood are reabsorbed and returned back to the blood, and wastes are only excreted through the distal convoluted tubules and collected in the collecting duct, and this is the urine. This is the collect the collecting duct and we can see that is connected to more than one nephron so urine collected from multiple nephric tubules gather into the collecting duct in the kidney and from the collecting duct they pour into the pelvis the kidney's pelvis which passes through to the ureter then ureter transfers urine to the urinary bladder where urine is stored till the bladder is full. Just then the sphincter opens and the walls contract, expelling urine outside through the ureter. So what happens if all the filtered blood is excreted? If all filtered blood is expelled by the kidneys, our blood will lose very essential elements and too much water. If all filtered blood is expelled, kidneys will have, uh, we will have to drink more than 170 liters of water per day to compensate water loss. We also need to know that the blood volume, we already know that, ranges from 5 to 6 liters, 1.2 to 1.3 liters pass through the kidneys each minute. 1,600 to 1,800 liters of blood, of blood pass through both kidneys per day, and the heart pumps around 7,000 liters per day. So if we do a little calculation, we will discover that 25% of the pumped blood passes through the kidneys each day. And from these six liters, we almost have three liters of plasma. And each drop of this plasma is filtered and examined by the kidneys 560 times per day. So what are urine components? Excess water, nitrogenous wastes, and this is very important. Inorganic salts, small amount of excess substances like glucose and vitamins. But normally glucose can be reabsorbed completely by the kidneys, except in case of very high concentration of glucose in blood. If our blood glucose level exceeds 350, knowing that the normal level ranges from 70 to 120, selective reabsorption fails to reabsorb this excess glucose, and in this case, we will have glucose in our urine. And this can be an indicator of diabetes. Renal failure. When we hear the word leaner, uh, renal, sorry, we must think about kidneys. The word renal indicates something related to kidneys. So renal failure is kidney failure. Some diseases or infection can cause kidneys to stop working or renal failure. A person can survive with only one kidney and one healthy kidney can grow a little bit in size and perform the function of two kidneys. But if both kidneys stop working, we will have what we call renal failure, and a person can survive for a very short while, maximum three weeks. 
This is caused by accumulation of wastes that will cause toxicity and death and wastes must be removed by artificial kidneys in a process called dialysis. So let's see what is the structure of this artificial kidney or how can we perform dialysis. Actually we need to know that a person or a patient with renal failure have to have dialysis three to, uh, two to three times a week and each time for several hours can be up to six hours a day. So first what happens is that patient's blood is pumped into this uh, device or this is what we call the artificial kidney. So we take the blood from the patient, from the artery of the patient to and pump it into this device. Blood passes through a series of thin tube with semi-permeable membrane, something like a cellophane, and the blood uh, travels through this tubes. These tubes are surrounded by purifying water that is also pumped into the device. This fluid or this purifying fluid or what we call dialysate contains all the plasma components with the exact same ratios except the urea and the other metabolic waste. As blood passes through the tubes, separating between the blood and the, semi, uh, the purifying water or the purifying uh, liquid by a, th by a semi permeable membrane, what we will see here, we will see that this is, these dots are semi permeable membrane. We have the blood containing wastes and we have the purifying liquid or the dialysate. Wastes passes through the purifying, it passes through the semi-permeable membrane from higher concentration to lower concentration. So they pass from the blood to the purifying fluid. This process is repeated several times throughout the long tube until we have pure blood. This pure blood is pumped back into the patient's veins and this liquid is now having the urea and the, uh, all the wastes is pumped out also of the uh, artificial kidney or the dialysis device and is thrown out. <coughs> this is the shape of um, a dialysis device now, an artificial uh, kidney. And this is very tiring for the patient because he has to or she has to be hooked to a hospital bed three times a week for six hours each time. It's very um, life disturbing. So scientists now are trying to come up with a device that can be carried around the patient's waist and goes everywhere with him and do the function of the kidney uh, all day, not only six hours, three times a week. So now we're finished with the skin, with the kidneys, and we already, by the way, know about the lungs. So let's go to the last part of our excretory system, which is the liver. Liver have diversities of functions, almost 12 different functions involved in different systems. And the most common, and we already know, the digestive system, liver secretes the uh, bile, which um, help us in digesting fats. They also metabolize excess glucose by converting them into glycogen. Liver, we have, we have already said that they have excretory function. They break down poisonous absorbed uh, uh, substance for, they are, which were absorbed from the small intestine. They reach the liver through the hepatic circulation, converted into insoluble substance that can be reabsorbed again. So they purify blood from poisons. 
They also have a second excretory function. They break down excess amino acids absorbed also through the hepatic circulation, and they break it down into urea. They take out the nitrogenous amino group from the excess amino acid in a process called deamination. And then the urea is expelled through the kidneys. So how urea are formed? By a process we just said, deamination. We oxidize amino acids, our, our liver oxidize amino acids to form ammonia and carbon dioxide. And this ammonia and carbon dioxide combine together to form urea and water. This process is called deamination and we use it to produce urea from amino acids. Urea poisoning, we said that urea is produced by the liver and excreted by the kidneys. So in patients with renal, kidney, uh, renal failure, kidneys fail to expel urea, causing its accumulation and causing urea poisoning. We just said the, uh, the word renal a lot, and I just want to remind you that there are some expressions we need to know to know that we are talking about this organ. Cardiac, we are talking about the heart, gastric, stomach, hepatic, liver, renal, kidneys, dermal, skin, osteo, bone, and finally pulmonary lungs. These are not all the expressions, but these are few that we need to know. This is all for me today. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, hope to see you soon. Stay safe. Thank you. Have a great day.